hello everyone and uh, thank you to be here today. Uh, I'm going to tell uh, uh, so you. Uh, okay. okay. We lost you for a bit, but yeah, we lost you, but you're about back. Okay, you tell me. Uh, so first, uh, I would like to say that uh, there have been some changes, uh, changes and updates to the presentation since I uh, submitted the abstract last year. So I hope you will like the new content. So this is a work in collaboration with uh, Meteo France and the Surfax. And I'd like to give some special thanks to Yann Michel, who helped me supervise Mathilde Moreau internship on the topic. Uh, so let's go. So the context is, that is uh, ensemble data assimilation. Here you can see a figure showing how the observation uncertainties are taken into account and um, to reduce the analysis error. So the dispersion after the analysis, after taking the observations into account is reduced compared to the initial dispersion. So this, this is very standard actually. And below is the corresponding uh, formula. So of interest is the second one here, where you see that uh, epsilon zero, uh, which stands for the uh, observation error vector, um, uh, contributes to the uh, final uh, error analysis, so epsilon a. And in that case, so in, in, the, in, in the case of ensemble data assimilation, we want to simulate epsilon zero as the square root of r times a white noise. So we generate perturbations and that will be the topic of this talk. So the general methodology is um, to generate new observations for the ensemble, we add created noise to each observation. So you, you take your vector y, which is unique, and you generate new observations by adding uh, different um, vectors containing observation noise. And, and then you get a set of y sub i, which is your different observation for each member. And so how do you do that? Given a, a W a Gaussian white noise, you, you use the square root of the correlation, uh, the observation or error correlation matrix to generate uh, re realizations of a Gaussian uh, noise with mean zero and covariance matrix R. So what happens? So uh, uh, in the previous, like two years ago, I did a presentation on, on how to do that for several data. And that was what actually, uh, what, what was actually intending for, for, for last year. But now of interest is how do you do that for wind data? And so w when Y contains two components, uh, U and V, for example. So what you get is you, or we contain U, U corre correlations, V and V correlations, and then there will be some cross correlations between the two comp components of the wind. And then R takes the following shape here at the bottom of the slide. Um, so what method is actually available to model R for wind data? R, R minus one, R one and a half, the square root of R. So there been some work to account for spatial creation in scholar observations, such as satellite data. So here are some references. And the modeling of correlation operators for vector observations, such as AMV or scatterometer data is a pretty new topic. The only possible exception is maybe uh, a paper from Isaacson and Rednauti in 2010. Existing work mostly revolves around the estimation compared to the modeling of the wind error correlations in AMV and scatterometer data. And when they, uh, when they estimate this error, they always show that they do have some cross correlations. So it is of interest to, um, um, to, uh, to have a new correlation model to account for these cross correlations. So the question is how to represent R and in case of EDA square root of R for these types of observations in order, in order to generate wind perturbation for the EDA. Uh, just before answering to this question, I would like to show briefly what these observations look like in practice. 
and especially what are their uh, spatial distributions. So on the on the right, you have the uh, scatter uh, the NOAA wind vectors uh, from the STCAT uh, instrument uh, on the on the whole planet, and on the left is a, is a zoom over Ireland. And here, the data were thinned around a 25 kilometers res resolution so that they are dense enough for our method to perform. Because the, the, uh, the interest here is to have uh, very dense observation sets uh, that, um, and so that it is necessary to take into account the uh, observation correlations, error correlations. So you see uh, so some features. So you see the densities. Sometimes there are some missing data, partly to, due to the, the fact that the observations are valid uh, on the ocean or the um, and and not on land. So there is a, a filter, uh, a mask here that's been applied, and then the, there is this uh, whole picture on the on the right. Uh, so let's talk about the methodology. One way to account for cross correlation is to transform the winds into two, so the, the U and the V components into two other components that are less correlated, at least we assume. That will be the velocity potential and the stream functions. And this is a method that was used in an article from Schlatter in seven, uh, 1974 for B with the additional condition that the divergence of the wind is uh, is equal to zero. And that was to model geostrophic covariances in B. So the the hodge helmholtz decompositions um, uh, list the following formula. The, um, so this is the this is not the same U as before. This is the, the full vector. So this is U and V actually. Uh, it, it's in both phase. So U can be written as uh, a rotational part and a gradient part here. And for those who are more familiar with the um, uh, vector cross product with gradient of string function here, this is actually equivalent. You can check it on paper if you want. But I like uh, this uh, way of writing the equation because you have two similar operators here and there. And then it allows me to write this in matrix form. So the vector u is actually a transform of the velocity potential and stream function. And uh, s is the name of this uh, new transformation. And it basically contains the gradient, minus the gradient, and the rotational. Oh, sorry. Uh, rot is the, um, the French name. It's the curl. <laughs> sorry, it's the curl uh, in English. Um, so there you go. And then we, what we do for the, um, to model R is we model the square root of R actually. And from the square root, we will be uh, deducing the formula of the full observation error correlation matrix. As, so it will be uh, R equals the square root times the transpose of the square root. So that we ensure the symmetry uh, in particular. So the square root of R will be the transformation which we saw before with minus gra gradient and the curl and the square root of a correlation matrix. So here you have a reminder of the, uh, of the S and the matrix C and a half will be block diagonal. On the first diagonal, you will have um, a correlation matrix for the, um, uh, the the psi variable and on the on second diagonal you will have uh, the psi variable. So actually, what what you can do is model each of these two components, assuming that these both of these variables are uncorrelated. Uh, you you can model each of these uh, two components with a standard diffusion operator. Or it could be anything else, but this is easier when you have unstructured meshes. Um, and so as the following, so I've put some stars because this, this will be the same. You just change the values of the, the parameters here and you, you will have a normalization factor, gamma, and then the standard diffusion equation with one minus the length square 
and the Laplacian here. And you want to discretize that over the grid defined by your observation set. So what I do is uh, because the observations don't lie on the Cartesian grid, I want to use a, a finite elements method uh, because it, uh, it is suited to uh, unstructured meshes and uh, uh, very various spatial distributions of the data. So I take this equation here over n steps. This is one step of the diffusion equation. And when you apply the finite element method, you multiply by, by test function, you do some integrations, you use the green formula, you do some, some, some math. And at the end, this linear equation becomes a linear system. And that linear system involves two matrices. Um, basically, the M comes from the one. So they will be here if you multiply by one on the right. And the K comes from the Laplacian. So you can see the K as the matrix containing derivatives. And um, so M is called the mass matrix. It contains information about mesh. And K contains information about the, um, the derivatives. So it is similar to a simulating the gradients actually of the observations, but you do it in a different way. So both of these matrix, uh, matrices are very sparse and this linear system is itself a sparse linear system. So you can factor each matrix as a, using a Cholesky algorithm, algorithm and then you can solve it over n steps. And therefore, provided that the number of step M is even, you recall this, uh, you, you get this nice formula for R, which is one minus Laplacian. So this is M plus K minus one M. And you do that over M over two steps and you normalize at the end uh, here. And because we model R as the square root time, the transpose of square root, at the end, we ensure that our matrix will be symmetric. So this is good. So everything's working. Um, what about the transform? Uh, how do you discretize gradients when you have very sparse data or missing data, or uh, maybe you remove data where there's land? So when you have a complicated, complex spatial distribution, well, you do the same. You use the finite element method. And first you write the gradient as um, dx and dy, and the curl as dy and dx. Uh, you can check it too if you want. And, Sorry, Oliver, um, you, you have two minutes left, and I think you were halfway through, so just oh, for okay. I, I can I can speed up a little bit. So okay. you, you recover matrices from the same uh, using the same formulas. And you can deduce the, the transpose of the matrices if you want S transpose using the fact that these matrices are anti-symmetric. So this is pretty easy. And uh, so this is methodology. Let's talk about the validation. Um, here, this is uh, the same data that uh, I've used before, but on a different uh, uh, domain, I think. Uh, and um, this is a typical response to uh, a direct impulse. So basically you put zeros everywhere, but a, a one somewhere and you apply the square root of R, uh, you, you apply R here. And this is what you get. And you see that you get this non-divergent wind. So this experience I've been using uh, uh, scat observations in a 50 kilometers resolution. And um, this is the theoretical function chase from Schlatter and for the matrix B. And on the left, the ones that I get on unstructured meshes for the matrix R. And so you, you get the UU correlations, the VV correlations, and the cross correlations. And what you see is you get approximately the same shapes. And this is very comforting um, here. And just this is one of the most, less very interesting slides is these are dead diagnostics from the AMV era creations from Borman 2003. And if you compare to before, you see that there is a slight tilt in the figures. So it's not exactly symmetric around, around the X axis or the Y axis. And the slight tilt 
it might be due to non-geostrophy in the wind. So maybe these two functions here, two variables are not exactly correlated in reality, uh, uncorrelated in reality. So this is the limit of the model. And there you go. Um, so this was a method using finite and method methods was introduced in 2019 in the paper of Guy et al. Um, but I, we extended this work to the case of vector observations um, to the wind data. But this time we are not interested in R minus one, but the square root of R to generate ensemble perturbations. And so here you go, you saw everything. And just some limits before I finish. The normalization of the creation operators is not computing analytically here, and it might need some tuning. So the method is not perfect. What I showed before was normalized, right? And, and we saw that uh, from the paper of Bowman in 2003, uh, maybe Psi and Psi, uh, Psi are supposed to be uncreated, but they are not in practice. There's a slight tilt in the figures, and we did not address the question of R minus one in this study, but maybe we can talk about it. And the rest is uh, for discussion, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, Oliver. That was quite interesting. Um, so you have a couple, you have three questions in the, in, in the document, Lars is asking, what flavor of NKF do you use? He says, is it the perturb observations, NKF, or is it the square root, or ensemble variational? And his point is that sometimes you don't need the square root of R to perturb observations. Sometimes you just need R. Um, so that would be for the, um, the ARO model in, the, um, in Meteo France. So here we need the square root of R. Actually, they have, there is always, uh, there's already a code implemented that does that, but in an inefficient way. Okay. And so uh, we wanted to, to see what we can do with a finite element method. But basically this is very, um, um, this is a work that's uh, very academic. So maybe you can transpose it in uh, any system where, where you need the, the square root. But, Okay. Uh, Roland had a question about discrete, if the grad and curl were discretized, but he says he got his answers. You already mentioned that. And finally, Daisuke Hota has a question. He says, how do you handle the boundary conditions in solving the Helmholtz equation when the observations are not regularly distributed and have limited spatial coverage? Okay, so I can just show uh, quickly. When you have this domain here, actually the grid is related only to the observations and not to the variables of your model. So you are the one that defines uh, the domain and the boundaries. So you can take the boundaries far enough from the observations if you need to and impose, for example, Neumann boundaries con boundary conditions. Uh, but there will be um, an effect of the boundary conditions over the modeled correlations only if the boundaries are very uh, close to the data, but because you are, you can choose to put them far away, you, you don't get this uh, problem, actually. So by design, uh, you can get rid of the problems. Uh, not get rid of it, but make... Um, Yes, get rid of it. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Basically. All right. Thank you, Oliver. Those were the questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your participation. So now